Ed, Ed, you. it's over. No performance now will make anyone think you did well in the first nine tenths of this conversation. Okay, the you most can you can hope for is healthy want, reconciliation. But I'm going to gain so many Ed, followers and subscribers I, from this debate, just like I do every time we interact. Because every time we I know, interact, people I see know. that I'm an honest actor <laughs> and you are full of shit. Ed, and you always end up in the pro NATO, pro imperial That's because position. it's Ed. You, first, you, Ed, this is the no first time we've is, interacted. It's always this enemy wait, country of so, the U.S. Wait, Ed, is bad. So you're saying you're saying that you're authentic, but you're right? admitting it's a clout shark. Good. NATO is run by rational Ed, bureaucrats. Ed, so you're admitting Ed, you that it's a clout always, shark, always but you see, he knows he knows that he's lost, so he literally will not stop talking now. Hello, can you hear me? Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. What's up? Cool. Not much. How's it going? Doing good. Here, let me switch the OBS virtual cam so my Zoom doesn't explode as it wants to do. And click this button. And nice! How's your day going? Oh, pretty good. How about you? Oh, pretty alright. Mostly been blasting uh, Tears of the Kingdom, you know? Lots of, um... Lots of uh, attractive furry goat characters in there for me to uh, to enjoy the company of. So that's been fun. Totally that's at nice. the detriment of my content, though. The uh, the viewers are begging for more um, for more videos, but I tell them, you know, I've gotta I've gotta play the Zelda game. It's a lot of fun. I didn't play the last one. For sure, you need that need that relaxation time. It is a very relaxing game. <laughs> so, what's your um? For the, the fine people in my audience, what's your name and uh, what pronouns do you go by? Uh, my name's Eddie Liger Smith. That's what I've been going by online for the past few years and part of the Midwestern Marks Institute. Um, and then he, him. So, yeah, I didn't realize it was a it was a collective thing. Um, it took me a second. I thought I, I, I didn't I was conflating a couple of things, but uh, that's based right. Collective is a fundamental principle of anarchic governmental organization. You bet. Or communistic governmental organization, I would say, or party organization. But yeah, I like, I mean, we kind of blew up on TikTok or I blew up on TikTok. So a lot of people associate the Institute with me. But yeah, we got a handful of good people working with us. Yeah, it's the price of fame. Uh, I'm glad that it's going well, uh, maybe. Um, so yeah, what did you want to talk about this fine day? Um, I think we had some disagreements over who provoked the current conflict in Ukraine. Um, uh, as I understand it, you s side with Ukraine, um, which I would conflate with siding with, uh, NATO. And I think uh, my position is that the war was provoked by NATO and Western aggression and the 2014 coup. Um, and I think you would have some areas of disagreement there. It's kind of a concession on your part, even to admit that, right? Because if one side provoked it, that means the other side started it, right? Like if you say one person provoked a fight, what that means is they said something or did something that led the other person then to start a fight. So even in your framing, you would have to acknowledge that it's a war started by Russia. I mean, the intervention itself, I consider more of an escalation than a start to the war. I think the war started in 2014 with the U.S. coup, which then provoked the later um escalation by russia as they they got fully involved and launched the special military operation these provocations keep going back and forth it seems i hope one day these uh these two people can live in peace definitely so definitely um yeah seems seems like a, a kind of an uphill start for you uh given the whole russia started the war thing but if you say that it's a continuation of a previously existing conflict, and I, th I think I agree with that. I think that's a fair framing to say the war started in 2014. So then I would just go to say, well, you know, um, Russia started the conflict back in 2014 by annexing Crimea and providing soldiers and martial arms to separatist groups in the Donbass, uh, which is a pretty literal example of a proxy war, um, considering the fact that Ukraine hadn't, you know, invaded Russia prior or prompted any instigatory secessionist action in Russia. It seems pretty difficult to argue Russia didn't start that, too. I mean, Russia was supporting what has been called in the Western media separatist movements in the Donbass um, after years and years of provocations from the West. I mean, the West has been promoting neo-Nazism and ethno-nationalism in Ukraine since the end of World War II. I mean, so you could consider that a provocation of Russia. And there's even... 
there's even videos of Joe Biden himself saying that we cannot expand NATO eastward um, because it would provoke Russia and it would lead to a conflict between Russia and the U.S. Um, or Russia and Ukraine. Yet the U.S. continued to do that. They were training up NATO troops on Russia's border, although they weren't actually adding Ukraine to NATO. They continually floated the idea and were training troops to make them NATO interoperable um, among all all sorts of other um uh regime change efforts or infiltration efforts in ukraine which everybody knows is just a swarm of us ngos and it's been that way for a very long time um sort so of like the i would say that state the, if anything i would say that the the nato project in, in ukraine has always been to support ethno-nationalism knowing that that's a way to provoke and attack russia and I mean, that was proven by Angela Merkel saying oh, hold, that hold the your 2014, horses. You brought up the whole, whoa, 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 hold, your, hold your horses. Well, let me finish my point. You, you brought I mean, up like four pro- points so far. So we got to go one at a time. No, right? I'm, I'm bringing you up have the fun. point of Western interventionism in Ukraine. That, that Are you starting to bring up a new you point? You said that Russia was backing separatists in the Donbass region. That was in response to all uh-huh. of this aggression from the U.S., which Angela Merkel admitted in 2014. The U.S. never had any intentions to sign a peace agreement. Their whole goal was Makes to sense. build up We're not military with presence there. in Ukraine so that they could eventually launch an attack against Russia. Okay, what Russia so, all right, well, well, hold it. Okay, on the wall listen, and got involved before the U.S. I, I'm excited back. to talk about this too, but my God, you know, I'm I'm getting old. I'm nearly thirty. I can't remember these points if you insecurely list seven at a time. If you okay. trust your points, you have to go one by one, because otherwise it makes me think you want to run away from them. Now, what's interesting to me. As we were talking about provocation, and then you went on this whole jibber jabber rant about ethno nationalism and pro- right. So, and the evidence of all of this framing established, we must acknowledge then what you're describing. If you get down to it, is kind of like a copy collection of excuses for Russia to start the war. Now, if you want, we can talk about the nature of these so-called provocations. I'm totally fine with that, but. Even in the framing you're presenting, I came here neutral, you know, but you're moving me over to the position that it must have been Russia who started the conflict. Otherwise, you wouldn't be framing all of these as provocations to justify them doing so. You would be How talking about prov- times. No, no, see, you don't understand. How are you they not keep- provocations when Angela Merkel literally admitted that the whole goal of what the U.S. and NATO were doing in Ukraine was to attack Russia? So you don't, you, you're I still mean, not NATO understanding. It- it's okay. I can repeat that part. You keep talking about provocations. Every time you say they provoke this, they provoke that, what you're saying is they provoked Russia into starting the war, right? That's what provocation means. We're not talking about times they provoked, Ukraine no, started no, the no, war. Because right? you're ignoring what I said. They provoked Russia to escalate the war in 2022. The war itself began in 2014 when the By... U.S. allowed a very anti-Russian government to come to power when these U.S.-backed ethno-nationalist groups Wait, like when, Right Sector, when did the war begin? C-14, the Azov Battalion, escalated the Maidan protests into an actual violent overthrow of so the wait, government when, when that allowed the war for these neo-Nazi begin? paramilitaries to gain a real foothold um, and begin shelling the homes of civilians in the Donbass, so, killing Ed. 14,000 people you in have total to, and, and 5,000 civilians you, in the speaks, Donbass specifically. It speaks to your lack of confidence that in Russia these points, get inter, get that you involved. feel the need to run off with them. I asked it, you I think specifically, it speaks to you're, your you're already getting upset. You have to continue interrupting Ed, me when I'm laying out what happened. Ed, listen, okay, there's laying out, all right, and then there's a 40-year land-making project, all right? You need to slow down. We'll get to all these points. It's okay. I'm happy to be talking to you too, but you don't need to script read at me. I asked you specifically when you think the war began. So I'm saying that Russia started the war. You keep talking about provocations that led to okay. Russia so we, started. So the we war. want to focus on where the war began. Yeah, when I would who say started in 2014, the war on the Donbass started. Um, and I would say who started the war? I mean, it was it was a combination of the ethno nationalist neo Nazi forces in Ukraine, like uh-huh. Right Sector, the paramilitary arm of Right Sector, Azov Battalion, and C14. Who were being propped up, funded, and supported politically by the the den of so U.S. NGOs what that existed in Ukraine that for a long started time. Started the war. The the coup that allowed for ethno nationalists and milit and uh, okay. uh, militia and right wing paramilitary. You can answer so without the addendum. Finish, let me finish. Wait, but, you but, me will you repeat it every time? Because I want to get through to this. We're going to take forever at this rate. That is. 
if you yeah if you continue to ask me questions and and then interrupt me when i try and answer it will take a long time if i ask you that, to, if, so I, the, if i if i tell you that i need to go to the bathroom at some point will you tell me that yeah in addition to, the... <laughs> to start acting with impunity start shelling the homes of civilians in the donbass and and that's what what started okay. essentially so, a civil war in ukraine you already Russia named, escalated and intervened in in 2020 you already named like several things so i asked you when the war started and then you did and the I script said 2014 again. with so, the coup right 2014 with the coup so did the coup so when yanukovych fled that was the beginning of a declaration of war i want to like specific answer wars are big deals you know Wars right. aren't like nebulous. It's not like a TikTok beef or whatever you guys do, social media clout influencer. Wars are like big things. They're usually like Fort Sumter right. with the U.S. Civil War, for example. If I asked a person, when did the Civil War begin? And they were like, well, it began when Lincoln violated the rights of the Southern states by refusing to acknowledge and enforce the Dred Scott's. It's well, okay, well, all right now. But when did the war begin? I ask you. I would say when right sector took over or took hold of most of the government buildings and their leader said that we are not going to hand over these buildings until Yanukovych is dismissed as president. Those are our demands. And at that, that point, Yanukovych fled and the paramilitaries were able to essentially act with impunity and start shelling the homes of civilians in eastern oh, you, Ukraine. Wait, wait, hold on. And, and that was that's the, the war. Wait, hold on. The, the it, coup... it's civilians in eastern Ukraine versus what, the the euro ukrainian wait, government the way you're making it sound it's like the guys in the euro maidan like they left the capital building and then walked a thousand miles east with artillery pieces and started shelling like orphanages you keep blurring things when did the war start was it when they entered the capital building because hey listen i love me some uh, anti-republican hysteria but i don't think january 6 was a war you know it was an attempt at an insurrection uh you, well, you think I, it was a it, war when they when they protested to get yanukovych out uh, I would say it was a war when they started taking military actions against, um, like Lugansk, Donetsk, these places in okay. the Donbass. Okay, so it where, wasn't actually uh, fourteen thousand people were killed. So it wasn't actually the Yanukovych bit. That's just like the 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 predecessor to this. What we're really talking yes, about that is was the, the conflict pretext in the Donbass. that allowed for it to happen. But that, as you said, wars are very serious things. So it's mm -hmm. important to understand not just when they started or or you know who provoke them, but um, also the pretext that allowed them to happen. And the pretext of this war is a U.S. backed coup that would have been impossible without U.S. NGOs backing these groups and like right sector Joe Biden who such, first right. took power of the government and then waged the war against the people of the Donbass. So I'm still I'm still really confused. So you say the war began when the right sector marched over a thousand miles east with artillery pieces. That's fine. That can happen. But um that I mean, was, right sector spread out. The one hundred percent of the right sector troops weren't in Maidan, right? Well, and you were they, kind of they blurring it all power together. The government consolidated power, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily the neo Nazis, but like I said, they they consolidated power and that they were essentially able to act with impunity after the coup. And then, yes, they marched east and began their offensive against civilians in the Donbass. Against civilians, yeah. Russia did then start supporting. Oh, what date right? did that happen? The attacks in the civilian population, out of curiosity. It began in 2014, and it's lasted through today. Oh, I know it's happened in 2014. I'm asking you when the date was, because that just seems odd. So they're far-right people. Now, I admit far-right people are pretty evil. I wouldn't put it past them to do all sorts of bad stuff. But they just, to celebrate ousting Yanukovych, they just start shelling civilian buildings. That's That's an odd... Why would they? Was there a disagreement? What happened? That's the that's the ethno nationalist ideology. That's the neo fascist ideology that the U.S. That's I mean that's the Banderite ideology. I, I say the U.S. has backed this ideology since World War II, but even before that, during the World War, they were I mean more so Britain than the U.S. were backing Stepan Bandera, uh, an ally of Hitler, who was you know staunchly anti Russian, anti Polish, anti Jewish. Mm -hmm. And they've allowed this ethno nationalist uh, ideology that holds Bandera as a hero um, to fester in Ukraine. And they funneled money into it um, until they could, you know, um, or until those those um, paramilitaries and militias became emboldened enough to where they could wage a full scale scale war against um, the largely Russian speaking and the largely cu uh, culturally Russian people in Eastern Ukraine. Of course. Who were beginning, like you said, to separate and see what was going on with the Maidan coup, oh, see well, this anti-Russian government take power. Um, well, hold hold on now, wait. You, hmm, you added a little detail there. We're beginning to separate. What, 
what happened? You, you, you're this timeline that you, you keep omitting things. I just want to get a full picture. What was the date that actions in the Donbass begin to take place from the right sector? Like full scale military actions to where they're where they're able to act with impunity. Because before I'm just that, wondering there was if anything cause the, happened the beforehand. conflict. Because the conflict between the nationalists and the Russian speakers in Ukraine has been raging for a long time. Right. The 2014 coup really brought it to a head because it allowed these groups like right sector to act with impunity and start blowing up the homes of civilians. Eddie, I asked for a date. 2014. Yeah, that's dude, not a date, I don't know Eddie, the exact, that's a year. I do not know the exact month, time and, and date when the first shell was fired at civilian homes in the Donbass. OK, but I can tell you that 2014 onward. Um, 14,000 people were killed there, the majority of them being people in the Donbass. Yes, yeah, of course, there horrible. were people killed on so the Ukrainian side. That's the, how war the works. The reason I'm asking, because I, a neutrally minded person who's just looking to get the straight facts, I'm reading up on this right now, and it says that on April 12th, 2014, of course, armed members of the Donbass People's Militia seized government buildings in Kramatorsk and Sovyansk and set up checkpoints and barricades. And the same day, former members of the Donetsk Berkut unit joined the ranks of the Donbass People's Militia. So it seemed like, now I don't know the exact timeline here, you'll have to fill me in. It seems like there was an actual armed military insurrection in the Donbass, which makes me wonder if any violence that took place there afterwards might have actually been provoked by these separatist groups? Um, did, I'm just curious. We like talking about provocation. Is Wikipedia the source on that? Uh, no. Do you want like the source do you want to look at it yeah i'll take it wait I'll actually it, but yeah wait, yeah wait. yeah what's and, what's your date like for would, that though what what's your date for that though are you denying that ever happened for, no 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 like as i said earlier not only were there there groups who were arming up and defending themselves in the donbass um, but those groups were backed by russia russia was supporting these groups Right. That doesn't justify a, a fascist ethno nationalist coup. Right. Of course, like if you see these ethno nationalists who the have hated Russians before. for years, who are putting up statues of Stepan Bandera, Wait, this you're, mass you're getting confused who, again. This the mass coup, murderer who hated Russians. You know, like was right ousted sector, before this. Continuing to seize in these groups like right sector, continuing to seize more and more power. Yeah. Eddie, you're going to arm yourself. You're, you're going to defend yourself. You're getting these, the, this is people defending their home. You're getting the right, timeline from, confused. From, Eddie, Eddie, you're getting the timeline confused. The coup was before this. It seems like to me Yanukovych was ousted. And then uh, military groups in the East uh, formed the Donbass People's Militia yes, and seized government as buildings. as I said before, dude, as I said, you're, you're, I feel like you're playing dumb on then, purpose. Wait, then dude, where did you You're smarter than this. As I said before, the conflict, let me finish, uh -huh. the conflict between the Ukrainian ethno-nationalists and the Russian speakers was going on for a very, very, very long time before the coup happened. Mm -hmm. The coup allowed it to come to a head and essentially gave these groups like Right Sector, who have always hated Russian speaking people in the Donbass region, ethnically Russian people in the Donbass region, to act with impunity I'm and start shooting. Getting confused again, Eddie. So yes, there were militia. No, you're confused. There were militia in what the Donbass said. who See... were arming themselves <laughs> and preparing to protect themselves before the coup happened. Okay. Yes, and so, yeah, Russia was supporting them. It's just that doesn't mean I support a Nazi coup. Oh, hold... that doesn't mean I support blowing up running, people's homes. You're running. And it doesn't mean in you're this broader out. conflict I'm going to side with. You're NATO. moving on. All right, we're pulling you back. Okay. So it's just Only interesting back. that when you initially described what began um, in the Donbass, you said there was a coup and then the right sector marched over and started shelling civilians. And what you neglected to mention was several thousand uh, militiamen and former soldiers uh, trying to secede from the government by seizing government buildings. So I it seems like there was a middle point there where the way you described it, I thought these guys, they did the coup, Yanukovych ousted, and then they just went over and started killing Russian-speaking people in the East. But then in the middle of those two things, there were actually thousands of soldiers who seized government buildings and set up barricades. That, I don't know, Eddie, as a person who's just learning in, about this, I feel like that might actually warrant some kind of military aggression in response. Uh, I mean, also, oh, these, you are do places people that, these are buildings. also places that voted to become independent republics. So they're perfect. Uh, as I said, it's their own land where they've lived for years. So they're That's perfectly not how countries in, work. They're Eddie. perfectly right to, you know, take the or to hold control of government buildings in that region, especially when it's obvious that, you know, right sector and these other groups are going to want to gain control of buildings in eastern Ukraine. That's, that's so not the people how countries of the Donbass work, dug Eddie. Them their heels. 
and you also with you're, the civil you're war? lying and you're saying that i just said everything started with the coup no i've been very very clear that this is a conflict that culminated in the coup and that the the people in the donbass um, were preparing to have to defend themselves um, from the the ethno nationalists who had been a persistent problem in ukraine i mean they knew that for years right you you i did ask you for a starting point you said the coup but that's okay we can amend this as much as we need to it's a complicated bit of history um however I'm sorry to say, we don't actually live in a communist utopia. Just because people in an area don't want to be part of a country doesn't actually mean that you can have thousands of soldiers seize local government positions. That's the kind of thing that does lead to military aggression. If you've paid attention so then to your you're history, against the well, Euro hold on, wait, wait, hold on. I'm not, I'm not done. Hold on. If you pay attention to your history class, there was a thing in the you know, United States called the Civil War where the South argued that they had the right to secede from the Union because they had different values and goals. Um, they were wrong apparently history proved them wrong um this actually happens quite a lot you know um you can't have like texas couldn't secede today you would need a really strong moral argument for secession in order for there to be uh i think a, a reasonable discussion yeah like civilians subject. having their homes bombed by neo-nazis wait, how's that for a wait, strong moral but they, argument <laughs> they formed the militia before the fighting started Yes, but the neo Nazis had been there long before, and they had been killing people long before. But you seem after confused the coup, they on were the able to act with impunity and escalate it greatly. Again, you're being dumb on purpose. Wait, come on. I think we're both confused about the timeline now. So there was this fighting in the Donbass before the because you you didn't even mention the thousands of people in the um the Donbass militia. What else are you leaving out of this? What did the right I sector do the people in the, the Donbass East militia, and I even said they're backed by Russia. Thousands of soldiers rising up to seize government buildings, because as far you're as I can lying. tell, that's the first violent thing that happened. Seems like Russia's provoking no, conflict. that's not I the first. If, I mean, it'd be impossible to place the first violent thing that happened, but based on my knowledge, you could go all the way back to World War II with the massacres that Stepan Mandera committed against Jews and Poles and all sorts of... Um, that was the first time there was in violence Ukraine. in Ukraine? No, I said you could go back way further than that, but based oh. on my knowledge of Ukraine, that's where I could pinpoint, or that's where I know of the first ethno-nationalist violence happening. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's tons of violence in, in every country going back all throughout their history. Sometimes, you know, people get in fights in the streets. I feel like you're trying to get caught up on semantics here because you realize your broader argument uh, puts you in support of NATO and NATO back. Wait, wait, wait. We haven't even got, I haven't even made an argument. I'm just really interested in the timeline. We keep finding little bits that you leave out, but that's okay. We're both learning, right? I mean, you learned about the Civil War and that you can't I actually secede. I haven't learned anything from this. <laughs> You're just well, asking semantics debates, and I'm trying to explain that seems a like really a complex problem, piece man. of history that led to the current current conflict. I'm learning. So, okay, okay. let me... Good. Okay, let's, I could educate let's, let's reestablish it. Okay, we'll track the timeline. Yeah. So, um, there, Yanukovych is ousted, right, in the protests, Euromaidan, blah, blah. Um, and then thousands of soldiers in the east the separatists seize control of government buildings set up barricades blockades so on and so forth and then in response to military occupation of government property soldiers move east in order to fight them am i incorrect on this um soldiers who had just occupied government property in kiev and so they wait they the really did move a thousand miles east who the people in eastern ukraine who the people what, I love how you ask a question, then you immediately have to interrupt. Well, you'd me said they you, didn't you just walk a thousand miles east right audience. after, but I guess that they did. That's so funny. You won't even let me finish. You ask me a question, then you don't let me finish the sentence. Uh, um, I just think it's funny that they walked a thousand miles east right after the coup, but it doesn't do matter. Think, they can do that if planes exist, man. Did you know that? Um, okay, so yes, and there's the also coup. people from right sector, man, all over the country. They weren't just all concentrated in Kiev. Uh -huh. The leadership was a lot of them where they seized government buildings and ousted the democratically elected leader who the people in the Donbass rightfully voted for. Well, the people on the Donbass saw the writing on the wall and 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 organized themselves and, and got ready to defend their own territory from this neo-Nazi undemocratically elected U.S. puppet government that took power. Um, uh, and, U.S. And puppet that's what led into the war of the Donbass. Okay, so let's let's address this. Every time I ask you a question, you take five minutes to remind me about yes, all the Nazis. Yes, because wars are very government. complex, like you said. Well, of it course, takes of course. A long time so to explain these I'm, things. I'm looking for an opportunity to learn more on this particular yeah. subject. So it seems like, in terms of organized violence following the coup, it was actually your guys who started it. Thousands of soldiers no. seizing government buildings is undeniably an act of martial aggression, arguably war, especially since you've acknowledged the fact that Russia backed them. So 
It seems like Russia both started and provoked this war, but I'm interested in the moral side of things, right? You keep talking about the right sector, the Nazis, the so on and so forth, right? Now, now again, I don't know anything about this whole subject, but I'm aware even of Azov Battalion, there being Nazis in Ukraine. I mean, I've heard the stories. I've you seen... don't know who right sector is? No, I didn't. I didn't say it. I just said I know about. Well, hold on. Wait, oh. listen, do you want me to? Okay, that's fine. We'll keep going. I, I just here. thought you said that. That was surprising to me. I, so I just want a clarification. No, no, no. I know I've heard stories about all this. Um, okay. you know, I, I about the Nazis and what have you. But what's what's interesting to me is that when I um when I look at Ukraine's government broadly, I don't really get the impression of a genocidal government. You know, the Nazis government, like the Nazi Nazis, right, were genocidal, of course. That was key and component to their ideology. I saw stuff Ukraine has done that I don't agree with. There was the Ukraine language law, for example. I think that's pretty cringe. I don't support that. But in you don't see that as a genocidal policy to try and crack down on minority languages. And, and, and the main thing about the language law, too, is it tries to assert the Ukrainian identity as being people who speak Ukrainian. So it's it's essentially designed to say Russian speakers are not Ukrainian. They don't have a place in our country. It's, it's a form of dehumanization. All right. I think it goes right along with genocidal so policy. I, I, I think that's a little hysterical. I think it's bad. And I agree that it indicates ethnic and linguistic preference. Many countries have national languages or have legal distinctions between preferred and non-preferred languages. I'm not defending right, and the that's law. Not what I have, that's not what experts on this issue have a problem with. What experts? they have a problem with is, is are yes. There, with, are they experts, what experts here, have, McCall? What experts have said, is the, the issue with the Ukrainian language law is, is that it asserts a single identity for the people of Ukraine based on the language that they speak. You know, which then dehumanizes and and says that the people who speak Russian aren't actually Ukrainian citizens. They don't have a place here. Um, yeah, which, I, you know, I agree that it indicates to towards ethnic a, bias. A genocidal policy. It might be. It's definitely mm. hyperbolic to say that that in itself is genocide. That comes up, but it's Nambi certainly Pambi an anti-Russian policy that could go hand in hand with genocide. I also want to say, um, to go back to well, we something done, that you said I was, earlier that I let slip. Well, I was this is more. this is in response to what you said. Um, you said that most of the violence was committed by, uh, quote unquote, my guys in, in the Donbass. They started it, it seems, in terms of organized violence. Yeah, they're th right. Their acts of organized violence pale. I mean, them them digging in their heels and defending their own land from uh -huh. the undemocratically elected coup government pales in comparison to, say, the Maidan sniper attacks that were committed by the, the protesters. And we now know, thanks to the scholarship of Ivan Kachanovsky, were being led up by these ethno-nationalist forces, right sector, C-14, Azov Battalion, etc. Or I'm very happy Odessa to hear that you remembered another building, talking point you forgot to go over. It, but it's kind of going the, backwards the now. The Odessa trade, trade union Wait, building Eddie, where trade unionists even, were burned alive. Eddie, um, Eddie. These, these acts of violence, Eddie, you know, anything that the people Eddie, of the Donbass did Eddie, to defend you might themselves notice, pales in comparison you to You might those, notice which, that whole... Wait, are you... <laughs> no, 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 hold on. Are you reading off a script? I saw your pupils wander. Wait, are you reading from chat right now? Did somebody no, in your you chat remind my, you? I literally have... I don't even have the Zoom open. I can't even see myself. I it's saw your eyes you wander. It was like you had a paragraph you forgot to read and you were like, wait, hold on. Gotta insert this. Man, it's okay. I'm here. You're, Listen, why are you this saying, is my job. We can lying. talk about this is all so of this. Fucking funny. To, wait, what did I just lie about? Hold on. Let me. You lied then and said I'm reading off a script. Let me screenshot my screen and send it to you. Wait, you, I, but your eyes you... your eyes wandered off the screen though. Do you have anything okay, written my down eyes here? Wander a lot. Show me your entire well, I, house. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of a lot of complex Show me your stuff. whole house right now. Wars are very complex, so, like you said. So we were talking about who instigated martial organized violence, and what you just said has I'm nothing to do with it. I'm taking a screenshot right now to um, prove this, because that's hilarious. Sure. Can you give me, like, a video tour of your house after we're done, too, just so I can really check to make sure that you did all this, like, off the cuff? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I spent all day reading and researching, because unlike you, I actually like to read the things that I talk about. Can you take a debate. video of you reading to prove it? Yes, okay. I will. Thank you. So and anyway, you make a video reading all the theory. So tangents aside, um, we were talking about um, the language law. Oh, oh yeah, you were being um, a bit hysterical about it. I agree it's very bad. I don't think it's genocidal. Uh, but apart from all of that, I don't get the impression the Ukrainian government is, well, genocidal. A Jewish president is a pretty strong argument against Nazi organization. I mean, I know that's a pretty common one. But again, it's like, Jews are a big no-no to Nazis. You said yourself that Bandera uh, types are pro-Nazi, anti-Jew. It's just odd that Zelensky would see not only successful elections, but like now overwhelmingly successful elections in, in the face of the recent uh, three-day special military operation. 
Yeah, I would say it's a big misconception, even on the, like the pro Russia anti NATO left, um, that people think all of Ukraine is Nazis or that you know the leadership themselves are Nazis. Like uh, Poroshenko at multiple points, Zelensky at multiple points have tried to quell the conflict, have tried to quell the fighting between the ethno nationalists. But there's videos of Zelensky going into the Donbass region and having talks with these leaders of these ethno nationalist groups and asking them to lay down arms, and they essentially mock him. Right? They essentially say, "No, we're not going to listen to you. We can act with impunity now." Um, so it's not Why that can they all of Ukraine impunity? is neo Nazis or Zelensky himself is a neo Nazi. It's that Zelensky's just a NATO puppet that's allowing the neo Nazis to act with impunity, and those are the ones who really have the 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 power in in Ukraine, huh. as exemplified by the fact that right sector was the one who during the coup seized the government buildings instead um, until Yanukovych is is dismissed. So we're not going to hand back the government. Okay. So um, out of so okay. So, so they're I, the I ones appreciate shit, I appreciate you acknowledging this. Um, so you're saying that the government of Ukraine is not actually run by the democratically elected leader who enjoys massive popular support from the country, but rather a group of far right militiamen who are fighting in the east. How uh, do I mean, they run, do that? Run is a uh, is a. Uh... I mean, there's there's conflicting political parties in Ukraine, conflicting political ideas, and there's conflict, you know, within the Ukrainian. But parliament. how like what so there's no mechanism... one person running things. Right. But these ethno nationalists since the coup, when they seize hold of the government buildings and, and dismiss the democratically elected leader, have had well, he, an he outsized they influence can't... and an outsized power in this country. You can't dismiss a leader like that. They don't have the authority. He fled to Russia. Um, right. Uh, no. Well, let me read straight from the. I have a quote here in my notes of the. Your notes. The guy from. I thought you didn't have anything to read from. No, you said, "Do I have a script?" And I told you I have notes because I've been reading about this all day, and I can see that you haven't done much Ed, reading. Eddie. Vosh. I didn't do reading because I was looking forward to being educated by you. It's kind of shocking that I've had to correct you on so many inconsistencies in the timeline. You haven't corrected shit. Well, the agreements that were reached, this was after right sector seized hold of the major government buildings in Kiev. The agreements that we have reached do not correspond to our aspirations. What is this? A right sector from? will not lay down arms. Right sector will not lift the blockade of a single administrative building until our main demand is met. The resignation of Yanukovych. Then Yanukovych uh, resigned and he exiled after right sector literally seized hold of all the major government buildings after massacring a bunch of people in Maidan Square. And when Yanukovych was trying to stay in power and, and keep the, the government going, um, right sector said, we're not going to lay down arms and we're not going to give back the government buildings until this guy leaves. I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about when we say these ethno-nationalist groups have an outsized influence in Ukraine. And actually, it, I didn't even know this so much until I was reading today. Uh -huh. it's, it's increased since 2014. Right. At, at first, Zelensky was giving speeches, trying to trying to bring peace, trying to to calm down these ethno-nationalist groups, but they've continued to grow in size, continue to gain power and, and, and outsized influence in, in um, Ukraine until Russia intervened. And then essentially, you know, Zelensky had no choice, but to wait, use, Eddie. and the U.S. had no choice, but to use the Azov Battalion and these other groups as their main fighting force Eddie. against Russia and just start arming Eddie, them. Eddie, the you, you, you did it again. We ran off. I wasn't listening to the past couple of sentences because I don't think they were That's relevant. Right. We're Listening's hard, dude. It's no, hard. That's well, how you it, learn. It them. can be hard because so, I have know, to keep up with the jibber These are you know? complex things, so you got to stay focused. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. You really should because uh, you keep wandering off. I now I don't. I'm not saying I don't trust you, but I was kind of curious about this narrative. So I looked up this Euromaidan or Revolution of Dignity thing, and um, I'm really curious about this. So it seems that there were about twenty five thousand Euromaidan protesters present. Were those all right sector? No, no. Oh, okay. All right. No, uh, I'm just curious. No, no, wait, to, that's I was just asking for information. To, right, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, um, just, okay. Yeah, I'll no, I'm just know. curious. I don't because I don't know, right? I'm learning today. Right. No, um, they weren't. But those were right. the ones who escalated it into a violent coup, which is why the US NGOs realized like needed to make bedfellows with the most horrible people in Ukraine. Of course, of course. Right? Which is what they so, do pretty much every time, because the only way to turn the protest violent into something that could actually oust the Ukrainian government was to support these groups who were willing to, say, shoot people with sniper rifles right. and you, you're square. doing it again. But we'll we'll get to that, because that's a little that's a little bit down. Um, so, of well, course, there was a big protest. Well, I got to fully flesh out these answers, because they're not just simple. Flesh you know, takes you time to build, you know? You're in the womb for nine months, all right? Now, this call is not going to last that long, but we have time to build this out. Don't worry. Um, okay. So, so Yanukovych 
fled. He fled, of course, because the, 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 the parliament building had been seized. You know, there was like shooting at the Capitol and stuff. We can litigate the exact details of that. Um, but it seems that after that happened, the person who was put in power after Yanukovych fled, um, sort of the, the next in line, as I understand it, like he was just the next big guy. And then after that, they resumed the traditional democratic process. Normally, a coup means you put your guys in charge, but the right sector didn't put anyone. There wasn't an actual leader chosen by a group of violent protesters or a militia group. Unlike, by the way, the Donbass, where um, the, uh, 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 the Luhansk and Donetsk autonomous spheres have been undemocratically controlled by military leaders. Um, how can this be a coup if they just resume the normal democratic process? I mean, it's not a normal democratic democratic process for them to say we're not handing back the government buildings until you dismiss the democratically elected elected leader Yanukovych. That is a coup. But like I said, it's more useful to have somebody like Poroshenko who will allow who's, you know, um, more center right by Ukrainian standards, which are extremely far right, who will allow them to act with impunity and, and do what they want, but who isn't openly an ethno nationalist themselves, you know, who gives the face of uh, wanting peace and wanting to end the civil war, especially how did they, before the Russian spe special military operation began. But how um, did they these leaders really want, you know, Ukraine, the ethno nationalists in Ukraine didn't want, you know, to draw a whole bunch of global attention. Well, uh, that's hard. Never mind. I'll well, take back my last sentence. Yeah, no, I, no, I get it. Um, so how did they put a guy in charge, though? They said they they seized hold of the government buildings and instead and said until like that quote I just read from you and said, until you put somebody in charge who we are OK with, who ended up being Poroshenko, who had increasingly for years been shifting right and moving right for mostly for political reasons to try and appeal to these these groups who had, were gaining a lot of power in Ukraine. Um, they said, until you put in a leader that we're okay with, like Poroshenko, we're going to maintain hold of these buildings, uh, the the ethno-nationalist right so sector. Are you suggesting that the entire government of Ukraine kowtowed to occupying protesters? How many they right did, sector they people? Like the entire, like, wait, wait, I'm just, just so they, I, I fully they, understand. You're, you're suggesting that the guy that was in charge after Yanukovych, who was like the next in line because he had the, the most proportional support in the parliament after Yanukovych and the such, um, who was only in charge for, I think, eight months before they resumed normal democratic elections, the right sector somehow made that guy the guy? Yeah, by seizing the government buildings, by escalating the protests into a violent coup, seizing hold of the major government buildings in Kiev, and saying until All you put in, major in power in Kiev, it's a big in power a until you put well, I, I don't know a, a lot of the major government buildings in Kiev until you put in power a leader that we're OK with. And, you know, Ukraine had been, you know, at, like I said, ethno nationalism and, and far right politics have been a problem in Ukraine for a while. So there are a lot of members in parliament and a lot of politicians in Ukraine who lean towards you know, center right or, or far right politics. But who would so have there been were a leader? lot of better options for right sector in these ethno nationalist groups, um, such as Poroshenko. Yanukovych wanted to get rid of the language laws. He wanted to remove Stepan Mandera as a national hero, who was then re implemented. Wait, wait, we're as running a ahead. We're running ahead group. again. I was just no, asking because no, you didn't are, really. These are wait, you didn't answer. You asked me, no, you asked me how so, right sector sees control okay, of the government. Well, no, no, no. And wait, I'm explaining how. No, you misunderstand. First of all, you weren't telling me how they seized control. You were telling me how they used that control to get a person in charge. Second of all, you're telling me what they said, but people say lots of stuff. If I went over with a microphone to say the January 6th protests, right? And I put my microphone up to a bunch of people and asked them, you know, what are you here for? I would get a wide range of things, many of them delusional perspectives, uh, threats, uh, expectations. They say they're not going to leave um until a suitable leader is chosen but the leader that got chosen was the next up guy so couldn't it was you... their guy well it was the guy who was going to allow them to act with impunity the, so it was the anti-russian guy it was the net well i mean at this point now all of ukraine's and, government and is also the, also let me say that also, was wait, the is leader it a and the founder of right sector who said that it wasn't just some random trump supporter sure. that you would well, interview leaders of far Six. right groups known for their saying statements organized this and was able to seize hold of the government building you're still like misunderstanding it would be like if january 6 protesters actually seized hold of the capitol and trump came out and said you know, we're not going to we're not going to let go of the capital until you put in power, you know, someone that we want. It seems like from what I'm looking at right now, 
The goal of the Euromaidan protesters were to oust Yanukovych, and the guy that got put in after Yanukovych was the obvious next person because he was the one with the next <clears throat> most support. He was the, literally the opposition party. And he was only in charge for a little bit, and then the normal democratic process resumed. The reason this is interesting to me is because when I think coup, I've read about a lot of coups. The United States loves doing them, huh? You should read about that sometime. It's crazy how bad this government gets. But when <laughs> yeah, we do, I gotta read about coups. You're right. Yeah, when you have we not do, watched our content, have you? When we do, no, I haven't. Um, yeah, yeah, when we, normally when I read about coups, like, what does that mean? It usually means like the authoritarian, like placing of a leader in power, not just one leader gets ousted and then the normal process resumes for everything after that, which is what happened. The fill in was the next up. And then after, after that, the election the Russian happened. language and started to ban opposition media and start and Lugansk and Donetsk declared themselves independent republics. And there was essentially a war going Wait, on. What does that have? So it's not like things just, you know, went back to normal after they. Well, no, the I, I agree. Russia made leader. things way worse. I fully agree with that. But um, that doesn't change the that's fact that's not that what I said. That's what I heard. And it's what you imply. Well, you right? have selective hearing, I think. Oh, OK. Well, you know, Everything we can get Russia back to bad. that. So it seems like this coup was really just the ousting of Yanukovych. You've talked about how like the far right has been you controlling Ukraine by putting their guys in power. I don't really think that's demonstrated by the evidence we have. By... I mean, you also acknowledge that a lot of the Euromaidan protesters weren't even far right. What proportion of the 25,000 were right sector? When I take a look uh, at the ones polls. who are shooting people and the ones who s organized themselves and seized power of government buildings numerically and, and a proportion then demanded that, you know, the the politics then play out the way that they wanted. Um, well, the way and, that they and, were I going mean, to look, anyway, what, after the ousting of Yanukovych, right? Like after you, Yanukovych got ousted, what and, happened and also, was like the how normal familiar result are you with color revolutions in. East Europe, because you say that coups are always, you know, just the authoritarian, whatever that means. I mean, we, we should lay out what authoritarian means concretely. But, um, you know, the, the a coup has to be the placing of a leader in power. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that that U.S. coups are carried out. Um, and a lot of times it's mm -hmm. very subversive. It's very underhanded. It's not just the U.S. coming in or the CIA coming in like, you know, what they did in 1951 in Iran, getting rid of Mossadegh and putting in power who they want. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it involves finding the actors on the ground who are going to allow U.S. interests to be carried out. So that's what the U.S. found in these banderites in Ukraine, which is why they've supported them since World War II and you know, why they found them very useful. So there's all sorts of ways that color revolutions and, and coups happen. And this is just a so, perfect example of one. It, it actually parrots um, a color the, revolution a is the when other a country color likes the people revolution in, in Ukraine. What a color revolution is when a government likes people. Um, a color revolution is essentially a coup. Um, well, that's well, it's, that's it's, a circular definition. If ever I heard one, I was asking what's uh. I think people of color should be able to do their revolutions if they want. You know, we're all equal. What's yeah, that's what I... the... What's the... Uh, a color revolution is just a term for like uh, when U.S. NGOs back certain groups who then overthrow a government, um, which, you know, works in the U.S.'s interest. Hmm? Um, oh, yeah, that's happened for sure. It doesn't I've mean that those. people of color are doing it. And I know. Trust that, me, the neo-Nazis who took over that was Ukraine a bit. were not people of color. And well, they don't like people of color. The original Nazis probably would consider them people of color, which is kind of funny when you think about the, you know, the way Nazi ideology shifts and molds to suit the uh, the needs of the people who use it for power. Um, yes, like those agree, Banderite yeah. types, right? No, no, you know, I, I, I fully agree. They're, they're bad. I just don't know if they've had as much influence over the way things have petered out as you suggest they have. Not to speak of this nebulous claim of U.S. support. Now, would the U.S. support the Euromaidan protesters, considering Yanukovych is, uh, let's say, Russia-friendly? Sure, I full, yeah, fully, of course. I'm sure there are plenty of U.S. politicians, leaders, maybe even celebrities. You know, George Clooney going down to Kiev to say, uh, yeah, you know... <laughs> Pro protests get that Yanukovych guy out of here um i don't know if that in and of itself can be fairly called like a, a coup or a color revolution though right because if that's the case it seems like everyone's color revolutioning everyone all the time whenever there's civil unrest well it's not it wasn't just blanket u.s support you know there was a leaked phone call from jeffrey pyatt and victoria newland where they're talking about the different actors in ukraine um and essentially plotting out together how they can escalate the protests into the actual violent um 
violent overthrow of a government. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's been very conniving and very strategic from the U.S. every step of the way. It's not just a blanket support. Um, as I said, they've they've supplied um, what what came of that, you know, logistics and, and information and, and political support for these groups as well. Um, well, what based on the changing situation in Ukraine, it's not just funneling arms and weapons into these preferred groups, which is basically what it became after the war. What now came the of that US phone is just call, funneling though? money and arms into Ukraine as our country crumbles here at home. OK, wait, 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 wait. Before Paul, that, it was, it we're was still in 2014. Strategic. We're still in 2014. Hold on. Um, what uh, what came of that phone call? It's like a call in and of itself is. I mean, who 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 among us hasn't had a call with our friends saying, you know, I think we should plot to overthrow Yanukovych. I'm sure well, lots of people. I, have I, what I came can't of it? say I've ever had a, a call where I plot out um, what's going to happen with Ukraine's government. I, I think that's um, exclusive to Victoria Nuland and Jeffrey Pyatt, who were I mean, Victoria Nuland has been overseeing U.S. policy in Ukraine for a long time. Well, what did they what did they one of the do? Most powerful people in the U.S. in relation to Ukraine. What was that? Sorry. But what did what did they do? You want to you want to pull up the call right now? I have it. No, 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 no. The the call no. is a call. I mean, what did right. they do? Funneled money into preferred groups via NGOs and you know groups like their, uh, the CIA cut out the NED and actually the CIA themselves um, have been involved in this too. Uh, what uh, what groups did they support? Groups, incited those groups to violence um and uh, and escalated the the protests and the civil unrest to the point where these US backed groups could oust Yanukovych who like you said the US didn't like um which allowed the US to begin building up military um and arms in Ukraine okay um, what which they were which is part of NATO's broader broader effort their broader right. strategy to attack Russia which they've admitted openly that's what but they're doing right now now i have more Russia questions than i have answers I still don't know what exactly. Yeah, it's they, a complicated issue, isn't it? You I fully agree. It right. Help help day. elucidate for me. Um, yeah. with regards to the money being funneled and so on, like what did they actually I mean, like in a direct sense, right? Because I want to keep things really concrete because I know there's a lot of broad conspiracism when it comes to color revolution talk. I'll I'll tell you an example, okay? Here, okay. Yeah. Um, US history, right? Now, mm-hmm. a lot of people back during the civil rights movement said that Malcolm X, uh, especially Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., were actually Soviet-backed infiltrators uh, who were trying to destabilize the United States. Um, now, this, this, is, this is false, of course, but it turns out, and we know this through historical records, there actually were a decent number of people pushing civil rights in the U.S. who had ties to Soviet Russia. They were not insubstantial ties either. Now, I personally, I think that's fine because, shit, I like civil rights, you know? Get your money where you need to, King, literally. Uh, we, we need some civil rights in here. But um, do you think a person today could then fairly say that the U.S. civil rights movement was a color revolution meant to coup the culture of the United States from the Soviet Union? Or would it be more no. nebulous? No, I think if a bunch of German fascists in um 1940 um uh overthrew their seized u.s government buildings and said if you don't dismiss our democratically elected leader a bunch of u.s fascists who are being backed by germany rather seized hold of the white house and said if you don't dismiss um franklin delano roosevelt and put in power someone who's more fascistic more right-leaning we're going to keep hold of the government buildings you know that would be a color revolution that i've got it i've got i wouldn't an example say of the one. soviet you, you know the soviets funneling some money into civil rights equals a coup i've got it know? then i've got it uh not a successful one but january 6. we know for a fact thanks to a senate investigation that the russian government actually did deliberately promote accounts and interests that were involved in the organization of January 6. And a lot of people who have since been uh, arrested, indicted, whatever else, you know, there are, of course, multiple people on Trump's uh, Trump's team who had connections to Russia to the point where it's gotten them indicted and or arrested. That would be an attempt at a color revolution. Russia tried to color revolution us. They didn't succeed, but do I have it right? Do I got it now? Um, I, I'm not... Um educated enough on january 6th to comment honestly um but you should send me the the thing about russia funding people in on january 6th i would say that january 6th pales in comparison to maidan which lasted for months and had far more funding from western ngos than i'm assuming january 6th i don't know how much russia where'd pushed the, where'd into the funding it, come from russia wasn't able to turn january 6th you know into like the the sniper attacks in maidan square killed dozens of people 
right? Um, how many people died on January 6th? I believe it was one of the protesters, right? These are not comparable events. It's, uh, it's there was not... a cop and a couple of people. I think one guy died of a heart attack. Um, right. Yeah. So that's not comparable to, say, a fascist group burning dozens of trade unionists alive. Right. In a yeah, major that does sound symbolic bad. trade union building and then marching on the government and seizing power of it and saying, if you don't dismiss the president of the country and send him into exile, we're just going to keep hold of the government. Right. But, That's not what happened on January. 6th. I'd still like it, though. I, I don't say it's good. Like, just being realistic. So in terms of the threshold for a color revolution, right, the U.S. has money everywhere because we're the wealthiest country on Earth. There are NGOs and private actors all around the world, literally everywhere who have connections to U.S. businesses, even those that operate in line with government interests. So it I think like we want to be specific here because if you want to say, well, U.S. money was involved in Euromaidan, U.S. money was involved in everything, like literally everything. There's not a conflict on earth you can't find U.S. money. I want to know what specifically. You say that they were being funded through NGOs. So was the State Department like specifically allotting money to a group of like CIA associated NGOs to go to like the right sector? I just, how did they facilitate this yeah i mean we don't know the exact details but that's why things like the leaked phone call help where victoria newland and jeffrey pyatt are literally talking about okay you know here's the situation in ukraine who do we funnel money into now um, so that we can see our interests carried out and i mean to to ignore that nato has marched eastward and has made it their goal um to threaten and attack russia um I see you have, is, you have more evidence to be ignorant you have more evidence. Um, so we than know. Just the so let call, me finish. Right? So we know that this is part of the U.S.'s broader strategy, right? We know that it's their project to attack Russia. We know that the CIA has supported ethno nationalists in Ukraine since World War II to do this, right? Now we have a leaked phone call um, as U.S. NGOs are very active in Ukraine and as Maidan is going on and it's becoming increasingly violent. Uh, there's a phone call between the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine where they're they're talking about reorganizing Ukraine's government, how to control Ukraine's government. And this isn't some just random person in the U.S. This is Victoria Nuland, the person overseeing um, U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine. Right. So the main U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, the main person overseeing U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine is talking about how to reorganize Ukraine's government as U.S. NGOs are funneling money into their preferred groups that they have been well, propping well, up in this area forever. So, so and you that's know, very I mean, concerning. Going back but... to the, the thing Angela Merkel admitted, Angela Merkel said this, the U.S.'s goal and NATO's goal has always been to build up military in Ukraine so that they can attack Russia. Right. The coup fit right into their broader strategy. Eddie. Um, which is, I know, I know you want me to just hyper focus on something. Well, I, I mean, right? on but this evidence is part of a, a broader concept, and, and a, and a yeah. longer history, a broad and very vague um, and, one. And we need to seems. bring in like evidence for the 2014 coup doesn't have to exclusively come from 2014. I mean, you've right? laid we out a all the way pretty back to World War II. No, I don't think money going to Ukraine in the 40s means that the U.S. orchestrated a 2014 coup. Uh, wait, I just, I'm so. You talked about that's this. Not so, what wait, I wait, said. wait, 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 That's not wait, what I said. You I talked, said that, that is you a talked about that this. Matters. So, that the wait, wait, if you are Eddie, a dialectical material, Eddie, I'm, trying I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand. The development of Ukraine. Eddie, Eddie I want to understand. Led to 2014. Eddie, so we need to be Excuse certain me. and we need to we Eddie, need to lay out the facts. Eddie, please. Eddie. Leading up Eddie, to that. Eddie, please. No, no. I'm no, gonna, no. Yes, yes, Eddie. Okay, well, wait. So the point's being finished now as they are. You have to tell me, you've made so many confident statements about the U.S. involvement in this. Then you just said, we don't have the details. Do you have a detail? Any specific? Yes. You, so you just hyper-focused on that part? No, no, no. Like anything. You, like, you no, no, no. The, literally you any. The part about the NGOs funneling money. Yeah, that, no, no. That's what I'm asking NATO about. Troops in no, Ukraine no, no, no. I'm asking about the NGOs. You ignored money. the fact that Victoria no, I'm not, no, had a I'm asking, call where she said she was, where she talked about how she was reorganizing the government of no, Ukraine. Eddie, I'm how asking she was involved you in about that. I'm asking you, their Eddie, government. that and is you what I'm asking you about. To, say, to, to hyper focus on the part where I said we don't know all of the No, no, no Eddie, I'm asking we you we about the but money I just gave you a whole being funneled of evidence through of NGOs. US involvement in Ukraine Eddie, in the lead up to the 2014 Eddie, overthrow Eddie, of the government. I just asked for any evidence and you got upset. Set. I'm asking you for anything regarding the financial transactions. I know about the phone call, but like anything, you're talking about, you, you spoke so confidently on U.S. involvement and multiple fundings and right sector connections and so on. I know the U.S. has designs for Ukraine. We're an imperialist country. I fully believe that. 
but you've talked about it being a color revolution, and surely the fact that the United States has designs here can't mean it's a color revolution. If that's the case, then everything everywhere is a color revolution, because you know there are State Department ghouls drafting up plans for Botswana, like, statehood one day, you know, just in case. There are people in the government doing all sorts of crazy stuff like that. It's the job of U.S. ambassadors to other countries to talk about our interests relative to their country. I just need something specific, some CIA front that was set up in Ukraine that allowed them to funnel money, some like evidence found there were like 16 SWAT SEAL teams that were at the Kiev on the day of the coup, and actually they got funneled out really quick. And here are I mean, some there, there, there were the recent leaked, I mean, there were recently documents showing the, the CIA's long and storied history in Ukraine directly, I don't want a long funneling, and money history. In, directly funneling money into preferred groups in the lead up to 2014. Also, we have the leaked documents from um, the, the kid who leaked the the documents that he had access to on Discord. Um, okay, um, so, okay, so, so, who, the, so the leaked and documents, the, and so what, what did we do? US special forces have been active in Ukraine. So that not only are there 200 plus NEDs in Ukraine- So what do they do? Who are, who are you know, giving political support and giving actual funding um, to what, the US what funding? preferred groups and and where's the funding? On the Eddie, we're um, what funding? We don't have the, evidence the, of a it, single direct from connection. The NGOs, the NGOs, non which NGOs, Eddie, the NED, which was created as a private CIA cutout because it's easier for them to be clandestine about their activities. Which funneling NGOs? money into the U.S.'s preferred groups in Ukraine? Okay, where, uh, giving support to them, and that was revealed. Where's in the, the evidence of that? Showing Operation Cartel and Operation Aerodynamic. Eddie. This is the evidence. I'm telling no, you. No, no, no. You're just I'm telling, telling no. you. But like, where? The, wait. Uh, do you think was, it's evidence when least, you say a thing here, happens? Me, I'll send you the. I'll literally send you the articles right Please, now. Please, yes. Just a any evidence of like leaked financial transactions or like um or like a, a like direct engagement something because so far the only thing that you have evidence for is the fact that we wanted things in Ukraine and we're America. We want the world, man. We want the moon. But that's not evidence of a color revolution. If a document leaked that the United States actually like really like it wanted the the 2037 dissolution of Kazakhstan, and then it later happens, like you would need to connect something, you know, something direct, something material. It's called material dialectics, right? <laughs> yes, yes, you need to you need to use evidence on the ground. Um... I'm trying to find something specifically about money being funneled. I know, from I know link hunting takes a second that, during talking. Do you want to move on? And right. then, like, if you find it, I can look at it then when you hit. Yeah, it. I'll just say, have you watched the movie Ukraine on Fire? Because that's where I get, that's where most of the evidence about the NEDs and the direct Damn, funneling of money. I, to can, I haven't, comes from. I can watch it though. Um, Ukraine on fire is a I, I propaganda didn't, film. Yeah, I didn't have any sources pulled up for today directly about you know, NED money going directly to a group, although there are tons of specific cases. And there was the leaked documents that showed um, Operation Aerodynamic, where the CIA was directly giving money to preferred groups in Ukraine in the lead up to 2014. And the recent leaked uh, uh, Pentagon documents that show the U.S. Special Forces were involved in Ukraine. So that's but, a, but a perfect example of what? the U.S. giving money to preferred groups in the lead up to the violent overthrow of this government. Um, but if you if you watch this movie Ukraine on Fire, it'll give um, much more evidence than that and lay out things in in specific. It, it's very good. Yeah, hold on. There's Oliver Stone interviewing pro Russian figures surrounding the revolution of dignity, such as Viktor Yanukovych and Vladimir Putin. It interviews Yanukovych and Putin. In a... yeah, it's pretty awesome. It, it they it was they got all sorts of direct interviews um, um, with people involved. Um, you, and they they have that leaked phone call from Victoria Newland, and oh oh yeah they you they think have might here be. a a leaked speech of Victoria Newland where she says that we have funneled three million dollars into Ukraine in the last year alone um, to destabilize their politics. So she admitted that herself. Um, um, so I forgot that was in this movie. So that's perfect you, for what you were asking. Do you do do you think it out of curiosity if uh, somebody like me with no preconceptions about this conflict were to watch this and I were to see that they were bragging about interviewing Yanukovych and Putin. Do you think that might maybe lead me to believe this is a biased source? 
I feel like you should want to listen to the main people involved in the conflict. Like, what if we just bury our heads and not listen to Putin because we think he's a bad guy? No, no, no. What if we or listen, not listen to, to more Yanukovych than just we one think he's side? A bad guy? No, no, no. They interview many, many pro-Ukrainian people, too. Right. The, it just features I noticed... interviews with Putin and Yanukovych, which is interesting because you never get that perspective from Western media. Ah. They put you in an echo chamber where you don't even hear the Russian side. I see. This movie allows you to hear the Ukrainian side and the Russian what, side um, and then make your decision. What prominent pro-Ukrainian leaders do they interview for this film? Um, there's Klitschko. Um, there's a handful of the the leaders of like right sector and, and ethno nationalist forces. I believe right there's interviews sector. with Poroshenko. Um, uh, yeah, give it a watch. You'll learn like like for real. If you are genuinely interested in learning about this conflict, this movie is the best way. It's like the really yeah. I can in, I can see the, why the there English were gaps language. in the um in the timeline I got from you. It says starring Oliver or Oliver Stone, of course, Vladimir Putin, Yanukovych, Vitaly Zakhar. Oh, that's tough for me to pronounce. Um, Vitaly Zakharchenko. There we go. I hope that was okay. Um, and Robert Earl Perry. Um, Robert Perry's the man, by the way. You like him, okay? It's interesting. The starring section doesn't seem to feature. Let me see. Who's this? Z who's the Zakharchenko person? Previously served as Ukraine's Minister of Internal Affairs until he was suspended from his duties on the 21st of February 2014, shortly after signing a decree authorizing the use of live ammunition against protesters. Oh. Hmm, none of the pro-Ukrainian people you mentioned are in the starring feature of this film. I guess I can give it a look and also listen to the guy who was ousted. I mean, even if there wasn't, wouldn't it be interesting to hear the the other side since, like, we're blasted in the West with, you know, the pro-NATO, pro-Western narrative? Like, you, even say they don't interview Poroshenko or they don't interview any Ukrainian leaders in this movie, which they do, right? Wouldn't you still want to hear um, well, um, from the other side? Do you think that would be an argument in favor of, like, watching say not to compare russia and nazis i'm not saying they're the same but in terms of people i disagree with right there are nazi propaganda films and it's like oh well this is the side of things they won't tell you and that's usually because they're lying and awful right right that's that's not what this film is it's very good okay it gives you both sides and it features interviews with independent journalists as well as a plethora of of sources and it features a lot of, of interviews, videos, and talks from people like Victoria Nuland, who have been, you know, deeply involved in in controlling Ukrainian politics and orchestrating the coup. Um, so it's it's also, you know, there it interviews and talks about and and lets people who I deeply, vehemently disagree with on the pro-NATO side, it gives them a platform to talk as well. And then, like I said, it it lets people make their decision. Yeah, I'm I'm sure there's a narrative. Right. They're they're the movies clearly in favor of the idea that the U.S. Uh, helped orchestrate a coup in 2014, because that's what the evidence on the ground shows. Um, but it's more so that the movie just presents the evidence rather than it tries to shove this narrative down your throat. They certainly don't portray Putin in, in a glowing light, um, which I wouldn't either, obviously. So. Yeah, I have, I have some mild criticisms of him, I'd say, based on the little that I've learned today. Um, I was also looking at this call between Piat and Nolan. Uh, there, there's quite a lot of text here. It's really hard to read and talk at the same time. Is there any content to this? Like, where do they say, like, I have, you know, like, <laughs> I have done X? It seems like a lot of this I'll just have to watch the movie on. Um, yeah, the phone I feel call, like there should be some the evidence. The phone calls in the movie. We could play it now, but I mean, that would take a, a little while. It would take. It would be a little bit boring. Yes. Um. Yeah. Okay. Well, let here. I, I think the guy Yachts is the guy who's got the economic experience, the government experience. He's what we need is Klitsch and Tiani Hook on the outside. So they're they're orchestrating a coup, orchestrating the violent seizure of this government by picking out their players. Um, so yeah, like we don't have to go into the call specifically. Right, there's there's always the so much. We to can get we into, can read. Right? I, I can watch the movie as well. To. I know um, we've been going for a while now. Yeah. So uh, well, okay. So we we've talked a lot about 2014. You know, it was a great year. I was three years out of high school. Um, I don't know what I was doing in 2014. Uh, but so we're in the modern day. All right. Now I hear a lot about this NATO group. Um. Now. Yes. 
I know Very that in important. the past people have said we're not going to move NATO over that far. Personally, I don't care. People say everything every direction. What I care about is what's morally right now. You know, if we because if we listen to every promise, right, you know, I'm pretty sure that like Lincoln said, you know, uh, you know, we will promise you uh, freedom from slavery, but not equality for the N word or whatever he went on. Right. about. Right. If we follow every promise ever made, it's like, well, OK, I don't know. Maybe we should reevaluate. So in terms of this NATO thing, OK. Um, NATO, maybe they've done some bad stuff. Uh, some people have said, some people have said the opposite. I don't really know. But countries that want to join NATO ask to join NATO. Ukraine has asked to join NATO multiple times. We keep saying no because um, there's an internal conflict and that is, a, you know, it, one of the prerequisites is that a country has to be stable in order to join NATO. Now, I guess my question is, doesn't it kind of validate the desire that Ukraine had to enter NATO that Russia would go on to invade them because the whole thing they wanted to be in nato for was protection from russia because russia can't invade a nato country obviously that would be a right the the argument from russia was that if ukraine is allowed to join nato the u.s is going to and and their nato allies are going to use that as a launching point to attack us which could escalate towards nuclear war now you could you know debate whether that's correct or not until Angela Merkel came out and admitted in 2014 that there was never any plans to follow Minsk agreements. The whole idea <clears throat> was for NATO to build up military forces and military capacity in Ukraine with the explicit purpose of threatening and attacking Russia. Wait, what does that so the, have to the do explicit with Minsk? purpose, according to NATO leaders, was to build up military capacity and attack Russia. So, so it's perfectly reasonable for Russia to say that's a red line. Okay, well, if, if Ukraine joins NATO, we're going to do something. So let's, we know that that means attack for us, which Joe Biden himself, like I said, not that we have to believe everything he says, but he himself s said that he knew knows this. If if NATO moves eastward anymore, we're going to provoke a potential nuclear so, war. So, with yeah, Russia. let's let's talk to be catastrophic. I think we both agree. Right. Well, it's just obviously we can debate whether or not Ukraine being part of NATO would work as a staging ground to attack Russia, which seems like a dumb thing. We to don't do. have to debate that because Angela Merkel admitted it. Right? Okay. The leaders of NATO admitted this. They they said it was just a way to attack Russia. So wait, wait, wait. That, we'll, we'll get that to that. I'm going to ask. What, I'm, I'm leading into that. Going on the, the, the NATO, the training up of NATO troops right on Russia. Right. Border. We'll get into that. So a couple of things. First of all, Russia did invade Ukraine. So that side of the thing is kind of settled. It's really ambiguous whether like you could argue we would have gone into Russia. But like we know Russia did go into Ukraine, so that's settled. So the yeah. desire for Ukraine to join NATO, like that is a, at least from Ukraine's perspective, that's a that's a solid thing to get at right there. I can't blame them for wanting that, especially in retrospect. But the thing, okay, so this Merkel thing, you said there was never an intention to follow the Minsk agreements, something, something NATO troops in Ukraine, which confused me. The Minsk Accords were an unsuccessful attempt, there were two, um, to stop the fighting between the Russian-backed separatists and Ukraine's government. What does that have to do with putting NATO troops into Ukraine? We couldn't move troops into Ukraine. They weren't a part of NATO. Like, if we weren't following, if, if Ukraine and Russia they, kept fighting, it would prolong the conflict that prevented Ukraine from entering so, NATO. How so they don't sense? actually have to be a part of NATO to train up troops. So what was going on was the Minsk Accords um, were were framed as a peace agreement, a way to end the fighting. But as Angela Merkel has now uh, showed us, it was not. It was a way for NATO to build up military capacity. So despite not adding Ukraine to NATO, uh, they were training up troops right on Russia's border, thousands of troops to be NATO interoperable, which means those troops can go anywhere in the earth where NATO troops are stationed and they can they can work together. They can be in the same battalion. Um, they're trained up have to NATO, NATO standards, which is very high standards. So so Russia then began, you know, lining up troops along their border Um Wait, and how many so NATO, NATO troops do we have Ukraine, in Ukraine? So, so the point is, I just want to be clear here. My point is, despite Ukraine not being added to NATO, NATO was still building up military capacity in Ukraine. And the point of that was to eventually attack Russia wait, and eventually probably add Ukraine to NATO, which they kept floating. Wait, how, um, how many of doing? But how many NATO troops did we have in Ukraine? Uh, it was thousands. Uh, not NATO troops. Sorry. They were training Ukrainian troops to be NATO interoperable. Okay, so that well, they wait. Could launch military operations alongside NATO, which, as Angela Merkel said, would would you know give them the ability to. Okay, attack that's it's a very different use Ukraine alongside NATO troops so, to attack Russia. Okay, so hold on, I, this doesn't make sense in a couple of levels. First of all, every country in the world, with the exception of those that don't like NATO, want NATO troops training their troops. 
because we're NATO. I mean, we're the U.S., right? We're the best. I don't think um, every country in the world, I don't think Russia and China want that. No, no, except for countries who don't like NATO. I mean, like, if you're not ideologically aligned against the United States, I would say States, most of the NATO, world doesn't like NATO anymore after what they've been seeing. You can litigate that if you like, but there's no denying our military capabilities, right? We certainly have well-trained, well-armed soldiers. That's not, that's not a moral yes, statement. which is just why Russia was threatened by, right. by that NATO training. So, okay. So NATO training Ukrainian troops. The reason that Ukrainian troops were being trained was because somebody started a war in the Donbass and Ukraine, because it's a poor, at least it was a poor country, didn't have soldiers to fight against it. That's one of the reasons the Azov Battalion grew to the prominence that it did. You have these like ultra nationalist, like blood and soil types who form militias because Ukraine literally has no organized military to fight in the Donbass. Um, now, obviously, that doesn't make what they're doing right. I mean, I'm glad they're fighting against Russian aggression, but I don't agree with them being international. Like, do you really think the people so, of the Donbass were like about to like march into Western Ukraine and start attacking them? No, I think they were trying to secede with East Ukraine, which they did. That's what they tried to do. They had right. Yeah. So you just said that these groups didn't have a lot of power in Ukraine. The these ethno nationalist groups. Um, but they were able to seize hold of the Ukrainian government. Clearly, they had a lot of power. No, and they were able in the to country. seize buildings. And then there, wait, 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 you're doing it again. Eastern We've Ukraine gone over these points. Shelling the homes. It was, it was absolutely Western wait, Ukraine. Wait, we, we've gone over these points. The no, nationalists. We're backsliding. We're being offensive towards Eastern Ukraine. We're backsliding. Right? No, so you're you're making it seem like they were defending. Stop themselves. reading. Like the Azov and them are are defending. You're reading chat. I can see your pupils, wait. man. Every Dude, every time you talk at, at length, you go up at. into the right. Look at what I'm looking at. Oh, yeah, it, that is that is literally a tick that I have when I'm thinking. Look, there, are you there's accusing maps. me of being ableist? Look, there's maps up there. Do you think that's what I'm using? Do you think what, what do you think looking I'm at, reading? From, looking man? at the people look, of Africa like, and their um, anti-colonial look, spirit gives you strength. Look, hey, I have up? I have this I article from Consortium News about there's Ukrainians marching with Stepan Bandera, and then there's you. Where's the script, Vouch? Where's the script? Sorry, that I'm, I'm kind of taken of, aback by seeing myself there. It. I wish I had. I'll a just script. assume you that quickly closed cool. it. Um, we 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 visited a lot of these you can points. Think whatever you want. We were talking about. I just know um, this issue well because I've actually read about it, and I'm learning a lot about it today. This is my education. Right. That's good. Um, so we 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 don't want to relitigate here. Uh, we were talking about like NATO troops in Ukraine. It seems like uh, there was a pretty good reason for the Ukrainian government to want their troops being trained up because of the whole war in the Donbass thing. So I, I want to know where what was this what was this plan to invade Russia? You said from Merkel, right? Merkel. Yes. The if plan I Google was to build Merkel, up NATO capacity, military capacity in Ukraine, invade so it Russia. could be used to launch an attack against Russia or to or even just to provoke and threaten Russia and contain Russia, like. The U.S. right now is surrounding China with their military bases to try and mm -hmm. and, and and China's completely and trying to control true. countries around China like Thailand so that they can contain China so that they can stop China from growing as an economic superpower, which gets to the point of what this whole thing is about is the U.S. doesn't want Russia to reassert themselves as a superpower after they essentially broke the Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, yes, I know that the U.S. deeply fears Russian economic hegemony. Hold on, I'm reading this. Right, Merkel so the idea thing. was to build up NATO capacity in the region so that they had a foothold, a, a essentially neo-colonial outpost in Ukraine, which they could use to attack Excuse Russia. Me. Right. Okay, I'm trying to find that though. Hold on. And and I don't think I don't agree that the Ukrainian citizens would want to become part of NATO because I think they're smart enough to know what that means. They're smart enough to know the target that that puts on them um, from Russia, who have repeatedly said repeatedly in the lead up to 2014 said that adding Ukraine to NATO is a red line, right? We'll, we'll take that as an act of aggression and a threat towards us. Wait, I can't, um, I can't. So I think the people of, NATO, saying, uh, of Ukraine knew that adding, becoming part of NATO would put a target on them. I, I can't find the thing where she says that we're planning to attack Russia. Can you find that? What, what do I need to Google to find yeah. that? That's pretty important. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I have it. Because my perspective say. is that it'd be pretty dumb to attack Russia for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's broke. It's not like there are much in the way of material wealth to seize apart from your natural resources. Uh -huh. um, second, it would prompt the end of the world. That's not good. I've noted that on my notes, and it says that the yeah, end of the world it, would that's be a why bad it's
fucking insane, dude. That's why I'm, I'm so against this war and why I talk about it so Me much. Me too. Because they're literally provoking World War Three. They're provoking nuclear destruction for all of us. That's why Merkel's statements were so insane. That's why it was Can such a bomb. Find show. me those statements, please, where she yeah. said that they were planning to attack Russia. Yeah, hopefully I have it in my notes here. I hope so too. Mm. Saying Merkel invade Russia, war Russia. Merkel interview Russia. It's a Washington Post article. I'll never give those freaks my money. So I got two. Somebody in my chat just said that I won't find it because it didn't happen. But you'll prove them wrong, right? Here you go. Okay. There's an article from Patrick Lancaster, or no, Patrick Lawrence, and I sent it to you on Zoom um, that explains um, Merkel's revolution or revelations, which were a further escalation of the hostilities with Russia. All right, hold on. Cons hold on. Consortium News. I, I sent it to you in the chat. I see, there, I, I see. Yeah, I just want to see on, on, on the reliability scale. Um, let's see. What's the reliability scale? Does that tell you how good sources are? Oh, well, some, how do you some, know that that's reliable? Well, you know, it's there's always going to be like that that bias chain effect, but sometimes it's pretty easy to tell, right? Like Alex Jones or something. Um, right, it, stop clicking. Fair enough. Oh, this one says it has an extreme left bias with mostly factual reporting. Well, I consider myself extremely on the left. I'm extreme. Let's go. It's a great outlet. I recommend anybody follow it. It's one of the main ways that I keep up to date with what's what's going on in the world. Okay, let's see. Interviews. It was founded by Robert Perry, actually, who we discussed earlier, and who's in that movie, Ukraine on Fire. I'm sure I would like him a lot in that uh, movie. Hold on, Merkel's comments. Yeah. Sorry, just a moment. Um, this seems pretty important, so I want to cover it. Merkel's interviews with Der Spiegel. Oh, that's not a good look, being German. Right off the bat. Uh, Ukraine conflict, something, something. Merkel described the Minsk talks as an attempt to give Ukraine time to become stronger. Okay. There are various interpretations of Minsk's remarks. They are generally taken at face value as an offhandedly delivered admission of her duplicity in her dealings with Russia on the Ukraine situation. Wait, that's it? Her saying the Minsk agreements would give Ukraine more time to fortify? Um, wait. Where's Russia here? Right, so the Minsk agreements were intended and framed as a peace agreement that was going to end conflict with Russia. Where's the where's and the Merkel invading... is saying that Ukraine was building up military capacity. Where's the thing about invading Russia though? They were the I'm not sure if she explicitly said, I guess we're going to invade Russia, but that's kind of um, implied in the fact that the Minsk agreements, like I said, were framed as, as this is going to bring peace. This is going to bring peace between Ukraine and Russia. And then Merkel said, no, it was just a way for us to build up military capacity, meaning NATO military capacity. Where does she say and NATO so, military So I guess I, I made a mistake in saying she said, we're explicitly going to attack Russia, but but that's implied because like... I said Russia had said multiple times more NATO capacity in Ukraine is a threat to us, and, and that's a red line. And where it's gonna where push does us she closer to nuclear war? Where does she say NATO's military capacity? It looks like she's talking about the Minsk Accords giving Ukraine time to fortify, which you know it bar it didn't because the separatists violated it like immediately, so it didn't even do that. Um, so where where is where are we? Okay. Did, did, did you lie to me? I don't see... Where's the mention of building up NATO troops or invading Russia? That was a pretty big thing. You you predicated the entire legitimacy of Russia's act of purported self-defense on the idea that NATO has admitted that it has plans to build up troop capacities and yes, use Ukraine as a and NATO ground. was literally training troops, thousands of troops on so the border don't, So you don't... So you lied! So, this so doesn't say capacity, that at all! What military capacity did you think that Merkel was talking about? It's Ukraine. Germany's a NATO member country. 
Obviously, she's referring to NATO's military it's a capacity conflict in Ukraine as they're between training NATO Russia, on Russia's border. It's a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. She obviously we is saying... We all know it's more than that. We all oh know my it's a conflict God, between you're NATO. Deep. We all know it's a conflict between NATO and you're Russia. You're in deep. Okay, so you completely lied about this. You said that she said that they were going no. to invade Russia, and it doesn't even mention NATO troop capacity. And the only evidence you have is that, well, uh, read between the lines. Obviously, she means the Minsk Accords that were violated eight seconds after they were passed would give NATO the strongest military alliance on Earth the time to defend itself against Russia. Okay. Wow, I can see why Russia rushed to invade Ukraine up the back of evidence like this. Clearly, they had no choice with the immeasurable threat levied at imagine, their doors. Imagine if this was happening in Mexico, if there was if Wagner Group was training up troops right on the border of Mexico and the U.S. And then there was a peace agreement that said Mexico was going to demilitarize and, and we were going to have peace and Russia was not going to be involved in Mexico. What? And then seven years later, we found out that Russia was continuing to train up troops in Mexico. And Russia said, guess what? Wait. We never planned to follow the peace agreement. We were just going to keep building up troops. Wait, hold on. Wait, wait, Don't wait. you think that would imply that they were building up troops to threaten, contain, or, or attack no, the U.S.? No, there's no relationship right? between the NATO troop training and what she's saying about the Minsk Accords. The reason she's saying this about the Minsk Accords is because she didn't she's think Russia NATO would follow leader. them. As NATO she's, is no, you are reaching Russia, so hard. You were like, yeah, she admitted she would invade Russia. And what then I look at this article and you're like, about if not NATO? Ukraine, what military do you Ukraine, think she's talking about if not NATO? the country that was in the war, Ukraine, that was being that one. trained up directly by NATO. Yeah, that's not a secret, Ukraine's obviously. Military, Ukraine is essentially a puppet of the U.S. and NATO. Wait, like no, no, wait, don't run, wait, don't run away from the point. You completely lied about this, man. I am so no, happy I asked you for this article. No, you you're, you and now you're talking here, fast you because don't. you know you that you were caught lying. And you don't. You know you were caught lying. Because Angela Merkel was talking about building up NATO capacity. Where? Where in this article? Wait, wait, can you, can you control, I'm control effing, can you find it? Who is she talking about if not NATO and Ukraine? Listen to the quote, listen to the quote, okay? Listen, I'm going to read it out loud and we're going to see, okay? Listen, this is from Der Spiegel. She believes, she is Merkel, by the way. She believes that later during the Minx talks, she was able to buy the time Ukraine, I spoke that one louder just so that it was clear needed to better fend off the Russian attack. She says it, this is also Ukraine, is now a strong, well-fortified country. Back then, she is certain it, that's Ukraine, would have been overrun by Putin's troops. Any reading of this that involves, yeah, we prompted bad faith peace talks so NATO could build troops to, it's incoherent to begin with because NATO can train outside of Ukraine and we also don't need Ukraine is a staging ground. We have the, the the Baltic states, three of them that hate Russia right there. And 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 Alaska, I guess if we really wanted to Alaska, but no, clearly by this she meant that 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 and now Finland, we would need NATO to have more time? Yeah, I mean if you want to deny that NATO building up troop capacity right on Russia's border isn't an act of aggression because the U.S. also has NATO's troops stationed in the Baltic states. If you want to act like that and if you want to act like a phony peace agreement that they admittedly said was just uh, to allow them to continue building up their military in Ukraine, with which Russia constantly said was a red line. I'm sipping. The if you cooler. really want to act that naive and act like NATO wasn't threatening Russia with that, <laughs> you, and like Merkel you wasn't didn't remember what this article NATO said. All. Was your, if you want to act like the Western imperialist countries in NATO? Was was your memory of this article building up Ukraine? Uh, so they the can Ukraine on fire the documentary. Great democracy of Ukraine. Was if wait, you wait, wait, that wait, naive, wait, wait, wait. Do fine. they mention this in that's the Ukraine fine. on fire? I don't think I'm going to get through to you if if that's how naive you're going to be Do they mention this in Ukraine? If fire? you don't think that NATO was building up capacity to threaten and contain Russia, I mean, try putting the shoe how on. How many? The other I'm foot. sorry. Wait. How many Imagine NATO? Russia was doing how many this in NATO Mexico? troops did, did, did we Imagine have in Russia total? Wait, 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 Eddie, 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 you're jibber jabbering. You you're running away. You're running. Threat? You're gish galloping. But it's okay. We need to come back down to earth. How many NATO troops do you think we had in 2014 that you think Angela Merkel is saying the sole reason of a quote unquote phony peace deal between a war that is exclusively being fought between Russia and Ukraine is actually a time for us, the largest military alliance on earth in history, to build up our forces? What do you think? How what? many did...
what, many, what do you think? No, like, like, like hey, we need 10,000 more ICBMs? In Ukraine, which until 1991 was part of the Soviet Union, so we weren't allowed there, right? Um, I mean, we did. Why we would did we? Why do we need Ukraine as a staging only, ground? We have the Baltic states. With Serbia as a buffer, also, um, who's more pro Russia, but I mean, because Ukraine is right on no, the border. No, there's no, no, the, if, um, no, if you the, look the at a map, there's the Baltic, no better way to attack no, Russia. No, than, not, than not Balkan, Ukraine. Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia. Uh, oh, sorry, I got yeah. you, got you. Those tiny, those tiny, Ukraine is a much larger, it's hundreds of them, miles of border shared with Russia. Why do we, we don't need a shared border to stage a fight with Russia? Okay, We're so, both okay, nuclear yeah, just countries. Attack Russia through Estonia. No, we don't want to attack Russia. Russia. There's no plan have, have to attack NATO, Russia. Have NATO attack Russia? There's no Estonia plan to attack yeah, Russia. Well, it You're would be nuclear annihilation. Like you don't understand the geopolitical significance of of nuclear Ukraine. war. Is, the only really one who talks lightly about nuclear war is Russia. Significance for the U.S. to control and NATO to control Ukraine. No, you are, are we are we going to be that? Can you okay, really quickly, naive. out of curiosity, how would NATO stage an invasion of Russia without prompting global thermonuclear war? I don't know. That's why oh. it's, it's so disgusting. Oh, that we, no, your it, would. Out. Wait, hold on. it would. He's not going to stop talking. Because Russia says if there's there an existential go. threat to the Russian state, they're going to use nukes. Okay, it so, would push us towards nuclear war. Okay, and so apparently wait. the people in charge of our government still don't care. Quick follow-up. they continue quick, to provoke. Hey, quick follow-up. They continue to sanction. They quick, continue to quick dump Quick follow-up. Eddie, Eddie. Okay, so if you don't okay. know a way that we would do war with Russia without ending Western capitalism in nuclear fire, why would we do it? I don't know. The people who run our government and run NATO are sadistic. They're doing it right now, dude. Uh, they're, they're doing oh it right my god. Now. Nothing your your conspiracy theory doesn't even have you're a narrative. 9 11 conspiracy the theorists have better narratives than this. Us to nuclear war yeah, uh, yeah. The Western, they they the needed a four second peace deal They'll to build up troops. To we we only had four billion trillion troops and all the military might in the world, but we needed five extra seconds to defend against our so we could build up against Russia and we already had the Baltic states, but we needed Ukraine. So as well and our plan so for doing this can... was to give a four second we're, minx we're agreement we're ignoring the geopolitical significance of ukraine <laughs> Wait, guys if you we can laugh just you oust want. yanokovist we can finish our star wars anti-icbm nuclear laser beam what the uh, yeah. yeah no 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 well i listen i'll tell you have man attacking, i didn't know i was arguing against attacking russia through lot i didn't realize i was ha i was Completely arguing with a nato fan you have more faith in nato than i do significance of the country of ukraine you're like the biggest nato fan i've ever talked to you're like yeah nato is actually nato is actually capable of amassing the military might in order to single-handedly defeat russia and that's why they had no choice but to defend themselves by invading ukraine and crippling their economy doing it leaving open finland to the baltic states and also the rest of the world and also icpms don't need a shared border what? okay no 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 no. it's fine it's fine um so how's your day been uh it's been all right mine has too i talked about uh tears of the kingdom right Huh? Here's the kingdom, the Zelda game that I talked about oh, in the yeah. beginning. Did you figure out your stuffy nose issue? Did you get some neti pot going? No, I don't own a neti pot. It feels like Dude, it'd be so cringe to use in it. One. Yeah, <laughs> like a cute porcelain one, like my grandma used to have. Yeah, they're uh, legit. They work. They why? Do. Why can't we all just? Why can't we all just get along? Is my question. Um. We, we, I mean, we got to debate these important issues. Like, like we said, NATO and the U.S. are pushing us towards World War III and a global conflict with Russia. So, you know, we, we got to tease these things out, even if we have disagreements on them. It's, it's very important. I actually think they're stopping World War III. How is that? You want me to answer uh, sincerely, or do you want me to take the same, like, disaffected, I'm pretending I don't know as much as I do tone that I have for the entire conversation? I just, uh, your, your real argument or your real opinion. Uh, I don't think that Putin is a rational actor. Uh, for the most part, I think leaders tend to be. I think uh, North Korea, you could say, rationally acted. I think that their strategy of provoking conflict unnecessarily is actually an effective deterrent to regional conflict. Uh, I don't think Putin is, though. He is an authoritarian leader. He is, after all, pretty much singly in control of the country. Um, and he doesn't come across as a very stable person to me. Smart, but not stable. A lot of machismo going on in that guy's brain. Um, 
I don't know if the the rumors say his cancer is dying. I don't know if those are true at all. But I think um I think it's he, not true. Well, I mean, it's I, we don't know. I don't think they're true, but um, true. I guess I don't know. I think um I think that authoritarian leaders just have a tendency to get expansionist and militaristic. He made blood and soil arguments when he gave his televised speech regarding the invasion of Ukraine when the three day special military operation began. Um, I think that. Uh, he needs to be ousted. I think he's a threat to the world. I think that under him, the Kremlin has escalated its constant threats of nuclear conflict, even before the war with Ukraine. Um, and that the only thing that we can do right now is provoke conditions that lead to him being ousted so that a more sane, probably still bad, but still more sane oligarch in Russia can take power. I mean, hopefully they can have a democracy again. I think that'd be great, you know, like a, a transformative thing, but realistically, even a better oligarch. And him humiliating himself with this conflict in Ukraine, I think is our best bet. I think if we didn't help Ukraine, if we let them just wash over Ukraine, which he would have if there was no help given to Ukraine, um, that he would just be up against even more NATO countries and things would just escalate and escalate because he's not a rational actor and he would provoke and provoke. And that, I think, that's like the real World War III threat. So my hope is that he gets ousted before then and then we can all live in peace. I, apart from that, I don't give a shit. I don't care if Russia has its own economic hegemon. I don't care if they keep the the Kazakhstan and the Stans and the, the Belarus or whatever. I don't, you know, like their business is theirs. They're their own country. But in this specific respect, like this degree of bloodthirsty imperialism, I think this needs to be held down. And I think this is I, the best way of doing it. I think if if you use the word authoritarian abstractly like that, and this is a huge you know, propaganda tool of the State Department when they're trying to overthrow a country, you could pretty much justify the overthrow of any leader, right? Just say that they're authoritarian and they're not a rational actor and and they need to be ousted. And then well, I would also I, say, an I think you're underestimating the strategy of Putin. I think he is in a conflict with all of the NATO countries, like you mentioned, because all of the NATO countries are funneling money and arms into this conflict now to um, which I think NATO sees as an existential conflict with Russia, and Russia sees it um, the same way. So by doing that, uh, the NATO countries are already running out of of arms and weapons. So uh, Russia really is achieving what one of their main goals of the special military operation has always been, which is the demilitarization of not only Ukraine, but also the the whole of NATO and, <laughs> and the entirety of the West. They're, they're basically expending their military industrial base. Brian Berletic of the New Atlas was talking about this on his show today. I recommend people check that out. Talking about how the West funds and, and the capacity that they have to continue sending weapons into this conflict is, is dwindling, um, which has been Russia's goal from the start, more so than the seizure of territory. You know, we've... If you don't think that's true, that's fine, but we'll see in, in the mean... coming days as the NATO countries start to run out of money. Doesn't that mean um, and as the conflict starts to come to an end? Because we're not we're now reaching a conclusion where um Russia's not gonna get everything they want. I think Zelensky will probably still be allowed to stay in power. <laughs> Um, but largely we'll see the demilitarization of Ukraine and a, a huge Man. blow to NATO and the weakening of their industrial military base. Okay. Were you one of those people back in February of 2000 and God now, 2020? Sorry, what? Were you one of those people right before the war, after right before the war began in Ukraine, who was saying um, Russia's not going to invade, State Department is being hysterical, um, all the Western media is freaking out. And you were saying like, haha, they all want to provoke war with Russia with this constant posturing. And then the war did begin and you never like apologized for it. You were like, oh, well, actually, it's not a war. They're just responding to defensive action. Like you're, you're one of those people who will never recognize no, I said, reality. So this is, right? this, is, this, is, this is actually what happened. Like you're in a different world. No, no. I, so what I said was Russia is going to launch a special military operation just to protect the Donbass and then the West will portray it as an intervention. Right. And they'll that, say that that Russia is invaded. that was that was my coverage before the be. war because Russia was lining up troops on the border of Ukraine. It looked like they were going to go in. Right. And I was saying they're just going to go in and secure the places in the Donbass, make sure that people stop having their home shelled. Now, uh -huh. Clearly, since that point, it's escalated into, you know, a full scale. Yes, they've been very successful in reducing the death and destruction. And I've been honest about that point, And I said I got that wrong. Right? It's fair to call what Russia's done um, an invasion. Right. It's fair to call I'm... it an intervention. <laughs> and I was saying before the war, they were only going to do this small little military <laughs> yeah. operation. It's been far more extensive than I could have right. predicted. And the, I, I was honest about that. Protecting all the ethnic Russian speakers on the road from Belarus to Kiev, of course, the, the road where all the ethnic Russian speakers are known to be. I, I just um, when, when you say stuff like 
NATO is running out of money. Stuff like that makes me wonder if not it's money, not money per se. Political the will? West has a lot of money because the West in in their it's, current imperial very state wealthy, yes. is a financial oligarchy. But what they don't have is the same kind of manufacturing base that can be used to produce weapons of war that Russia and China has. Wait, that's... and the U.S. for years has been. Uh, involved in all these smaller conflicts like Iraq, Yemen, Syria, all around the globe. And that is what our military and NATO's military is built for, is maintaining a bunch of smaller conflicts all around the world. They're not built to, you know, uh, for a long, sustained, maintained okay. conflict between another this superpower like what the war when, in Ukraine is Russia devolving was into. Out of fuels, so yes, like the NATO's... In uh, manufacturing base and, and so their ability to this produce is, weapons this is, is being depleted. This is what I and mean that's going to become about, more obvious in the next weeks and, and This months. is what I mean about reality. Like, Russia was running out of fuel in their invasion like two weeks in. The reason they See, still the have so many media, though, has been no, no, no. Wait, wait. Let me play. Let me finish. Wait, let me come on. Come on. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. They didn't. First of all, they're lying. Second of all, the leader of um, the Wagner Group just threatened uh, just a little while ago, threatened to sell out Russian troop positions in his beef with the head of the um, Russian military leader. I really wouldn't be claiming that guy. Listen, you the reason why Ooh, Russia has no, been able, that's Western. You know, no, there are Western. You know, sources the reason that why fell, right? we're it's both a, not just like we're both Western sources. Though. The reason why Russia has been able to continue supplying artillery shells is because the Soviet Union overproduced back during its heyday. They're, they're emptying out storehouses. It's not modern productive capacity. This isn't even a secret. You can ask, like, you can look, where are these supplies coming from? It's like, oh, yeah, well, these are like, what is it, 144 million? I forget the exact size. Like, we just have a million, billion, trillion of these shells because, you know, we made a lot of them. We keep them in warehouses. Over here in America, like, obviously, we don't keep giant stockpiles of old munitions. That's the reason why with stuff we've spent over to Ukraine is so expensive. Because it's a newer hardware, and by newer right, hardware, I mean 1990s. Out. We're not prepared for a sustained conflict like there this, is like no Bush sustained is. conflict. It would end the world. There is no war anymore. There's no war between Russia and the West. Neither side has a way of stopping the nukes from falling. You, th this you isn't. Think, so no, you think nuclear war is inevitable at this point? I I think that it would take a remarkable amount of discipline and planning to prevent it, but with Russia specifically. I think the best thing that we can hope for is Putin being ousted. They can maintain antagonistic relations with the West if they want. It's Putin specifically who I think is instigating the worst of this escalation. There is no nuclear war that NATO will instigate. You know why? Because NATO isn't run by bloodthirsty lunatics. NATO is run by thousands and thousands of soulless bureaucrats, puppet men dressed up by those oligarchs that you hate so much. This is neoliberalism, okay? This isn't the same kind of system. We don't have one guy making all these decisions. We have thousands of committees that argue with each other and never get anything done. And all of these committees are centrally focused on maintaining Western imperial hegemony, which, mind you, nuclear war would not help with. We have no, no interest in nuclear war with Russia. That's the thing is they're so committed to maintaining this hegemony that they will push us to the brink of or even over the brink of nuclear war in order to protect that hegemony. And these groups of people running NATO and both political parties in the U.S. are neocons. Neocons Russia. are running the show now. Russia isn't a in threat both parties. to our economic hegemony. Russia has less GDP than Texas. China is a threat to our economic hegemony. Not yes, China is a bigger threat than Russia, but no, Russia, Russia is no. Has, Russia has is nothing. Been, Russia, since Russia's 1991, GDP. when the U.S. broke Russia's back, they have rebuilt themselves, and Putin has cracked down on the oligarchs and said that you guys need, you can still, you know, because he's run the top the oligarch and be oligarchs. But you need to invest in Russia. You need to invest in our industrial base. They built up their industrial base. They've nationalized. You're literally talking about fascism right now, which you we're know trading that, right? with Europe, which is why the U.S. blew up Nord Stream. But Russia has. You are. You, you know, are literally their economic base since 1991, right and the West can't have that. About and the West is you willing to push us okay, towards the brink the, of nuclear the war. The idea that can I, the can West. No, 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 no. Because you you've said so many incorrect things. The idea no, that the said West. So many, I let the you, idea I let that you spout literally mainstream media, Western propaganda. Wait, can I can I say like one quick thing? One quick thing? Now. One quick thing? And now I can't one respond quick thing. And, and explain Ed, what's Ed, actually going on. One quick on thing. Here. 
The Where NATO is trying to destroy the, the uh, Russia's industrial the base. The difference They're between mad that Russia's Ed, rebuilding themselves. Ed, the difference Once between again, becoming me an talking for a while and, and you talking for a while. Ed, you're so insecure about your points. That's NATO pushing Ed, us there. That's Ed, not Russia. You're so Russia insecure. Oh my God, Ed, Ed, do. it's over. No performance now will make anyone think you did well in the first nine tenths of this conversation. Okay, the you most you can hope for is healthy reconciliation. I'm going to gain so many followers and subscribers from this. Debate, just like I do every time we interact, because every time we I know, interact, people I see know. that I'm an honest actor and you are full of shit, Ed, and you always end up in the pro NATO, pro imperialist that's because position. It's, Ed, you, first, you, Ed, this is the no first time we've is, interacted. It's always this enemy wait, country of so, the U.S. Wait, Ed, is bad so you're saying you're saying that you're authentic, but you're right? admitting it's a clout shark. Good, NATO is run by rational Ed, bureaucrats. Ed, so you're admitting you that it's a clout always, shark. Always but you, find see, a way to he knows he knows that he's lost, so he literally will not stop talking now. Ed, you won't stop talking because you know every moment I speak, I sound more rational than you. You've admitted you're a clout shark. You have no investment in this besides the clout it gives you, and you earn your audience. I know that you know that you lie. What you don't understand is that I don't have to, and I feel confident about my points, which is why and I that shut is an up. That is inversion of reality. Ah. That is an inv well, okay. I have good, good luck. Tons good luck. You, you, you every time you brought a source, every time you brought a source to there, it showed that you lied. For you today. Every time you brought a source, you were wrong about it. Except for, uh, every source that you've brought showed. Is fighting with that you lie ridiculous western talk jibber jabber he just he talks believes. he talks because he understands he knows every source you've brought didn't say what you said it did you were coping for 10 minutes after that merkel thing you have nothing yeah. but one day hopefully you will realize that you can't live a life on lying for clout and when that happens i will be far more willing to accept you in reconciliation than your people ever <laughs> would me okay good luck oh, my dude so funny good luck wow, coping to your audience somebody's a clout chaser yeah, well, you literally oh, yeah. were like, oh, you bro, it doesn't matter who won because I get more clout. Bro, bro, it doesn't screaming. matter who said what. I get more clout. You know why you get more clout? You know why you get more clout from talking want, with me than I do with you? Because I'm a larger socialism. content Come creator than you. Us at the Midwestern yep, Institute. there it is. You learn a lot from me. And yep, figure. All these conversations go basically the same way. It was the same with, um, it was the same with Jackson Inkle. He doesn't actually believe anything. That's why every time he talked about any subject, he ran through like four or five talking points that he... That's why I accused... The funny thing is, it's actually less embarrassing that he doesn't have a script next to him because it means he talks and thinks that way. It's like the... It's like the coded, pre-baked language of a propagandist or maybe like a TV host or something. No independent thought. I can't believe... I can't believe he had that Merkel article and he was like, um, yeah, this show, she said, yeah, this is a plan to invade Russia. And then it didn't mention Russia or NATO. And he was like, well, read between the lines. Look at how she, look, look what it says. And it says, I hope that Ukraine gets time to build up its forces. And he's like, well, well, by Ukraine, clearly she meant NATO. Just truly psychotic stuff. But the, um, you, the only times that he stopped talking at the end there was when he was thinking what like train he was going to run on next. This is one of the, um, it's the type of person I don't generally like debating, but I did think it was particularly funny how for the first nine tenths of the conversation, he had no response to my like, oh, I'm just learning about this today and it seems you have some problems with your argument, which is why I did that, by the way. There were people in chat who were like, dude, you should go hard. But like, as soon as you go hard with him, he just doesn't stop talking and he's like, uh, blah, 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 uh, by the way, uh, uh, I get so much clout from this, uh, you know, oh, I get so much attention from talking to you, which reflects on me somehow. Um, you can't, uh, you can't engage, uh, with people like that in that fashion. Um, because, you know, they don't actually care about anything. They're, like, empty. Alright, well, that was pretty fun. Will there ever be a constructive debate with a tanky? Um, there are some of them who actually believe the stuff they say, but he's not one of them. That was the Socratic method? Yep, that was the Socratic method. 100%. I think you're wrong. He seems like a true believer. I'm not going to lie. Nope. 100% no. Uh, the best way that you can tell is that people who sincerely believe something, if they've been blown the f*** in the conversation, get upset. I actually find that upsetness rather humanizing. Um, but what he did is when he realized he was getting blown the f*** out and he like didn't have anywhere to go, he paused to like think, well, what's my strategy after this? And then he just didn't stop talking. Uh, he fully knows that he's lying. Yeah. That one red pill guy got upset. This is how we knew he was honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go and watch my debates, you know, whenever I actually do them. And if you look, um, 
Like, people tend to get upset when they really believe stuff. Why do they always fall back to, haha, I'm getting more clout? So this is what I've said before about, like, why some debates aren't worthwhile. It's because if they don't actually believe anything, the only consequence of engaging with me, even if they're saying stuff, like, the stuff he was saying was so obviously factually incorrect that it should be laughable to any person who's not deeply mentally ill. Um, but they still get attention, you know? All the same, I think I did pretty well. Yeah, they have nothing to lose because their audience is, like, like fully a accustomed to them just being wrong all the time. Uh, anyway, I think I did super well, though. I think the, uh, I think that, I, I genuinely don't think that I backed off on a single point. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. Can we watch that Ukraine on Fire documentary? Ah, if only it wasn't copyright. That would be pretty fun, though. Will you actually watch that movie he recommended? Uh, I might. I mean, it could be interesting. It's definitely just, like, a shitty propaganda piece. Um, yeah. He based his entire argument on the Merkel quote and it wasn't even real? Yeah. Was he worse with the jibber-jabber than Michael Tracy? Uh, no, Michael Tracy is the worst. Why don't they realize how spouting Western propaganda sources will ma never make them popular to anyone with a brain? Well, conversations like this are basically just like flat earth debates for me because the West has finished litigating this conversation. Nobody is like the, the Russia's propaganda department in the West is done. It's failed. Um, RT literally had to shut down after Comcast dropped them here in the States. They left a bunch of people like, like dropped unemployed. Um, uh, America will never believe the narrative that NATO started it. That's just not going to happen. Uh, the far right might basically defend Russia, but they don't do it by saying NATO provoked for the most part. They usually take this like Russia's defending themselves against Western imperial, or like, sorry, Western like uh, degeneracy, or more often it's like the Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, we shouldn't be giving money to prolong this conflict type of thing. But this narrative of like this pseudo leftism, this fake leftism, this, uh, this like, um, Oh yeah, actually, if you lie a bunch about Ukraine, it justifies Russia like slaughtering their people kind of thing. That's just, it's not a narrative that's going to take root. It's Russian propaganda is less popular now than it has been since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And for that reason, I don't consider talking about stuff like this to be like a civic necessity. Um, you know, because it's really like just a couple of online grifters who circle around these points. Uh, I just think it's kind of a good rhetorical practice to talk to uh, readers like that, I think.